Previously, when I introduced this different this graph, I pointed out the speeds at which we are moving. Okay, force times velocity, of course, and we can actually literally measure the speed at which the bar is moving. Now, it just so happens that generally 80% of the 1RM can be moved at this particular speed. 50% of the 1RM can be moved at that particular speed, and 30% can be moved at this particular speed. All right, And it's the actual speed at which we are moving, which of course interacts with force to give us our training effect. So rather than focusing on the load and saying, hey, I want you to do three sets of five with 70% of the 1RM, or three sets of five with 30%, I can say, I want three sets of five, I don't care what weight you use, but you better move it at at least 1.3 meters per second. This is termed velocity-based training, the fact that you're gonna program velocity instead of load. So instead of saying, like I said, three sets of five at 55% 1RM, no, I want three sets of five at a velocity of 0.8 meters per second. What weight is that for you? You figure it out. You put some weight on the bar, maybe it's 160 pounds, you check how fast you're moving it, it's not fast enough, so then you, of course, drop the weight to 155, hitting the right speed. Now, there's two methods to establish load for specific velocities. Obviously, there's the trial and error, which I just talked about, but you need the appropriate technology to do this. Or, as I said, we can use those percentage correlations that I mentioned on the previous slide. To apply what we call velocity-based training then, we have to understand it's typically only used for maximum strength or power training. People would not bother using it for hypertrophy purposes. Now there's various pieces of equipment available because the key here is you need some equipment to measure just how fast the bar is actually moving. Now there are two categories of, uh, of technologies you can use. One is known as a linear position transducer. This would be known as the gold standard. Then we have individual accelerometers, which are then validated against the gold standards. The difference, of course, is the price. We're talking multiple thousands for these, and we're talking multiple hundreds for these. Now, some examples then, just so you, you're, you're familiar, the linear position transducers, the more popular one that I've seen in the last couple of years is known as Gym Aware. Open Barbell makes one, the Tendo unit makes one. There's now a couple more because this whole push for velocity-based training has become bigger in the last five years. The accelerometer-based ones, some of the more popular ones would be the Push Band, Bar Sensei, or Beast Sensor. And you can Google, Google these to get an idea, but I've shown some pictures. Here's what one of the accelerometers looks like. So this over here is the Push Band. It literally, in this example, goes on the arm. So as this person squats up and down, the speed at which their arm is moving, of course, replicates the speed at which the bar is moving. And what you'll see on your app then is literal meters per second of each repetition. You get average meters per second, etc. This is actually what the push one looks like. This is a linear position transducer, such as Gym Aware, where there's literally a cable attached to the bar. And then from some technology in here, you are displaying the power output. There are some benefits to, of to velocity-based training that I think a lot of people overlook or maybe just have not been exposed to. Now, one of the things that a lot of people do like about it is simply that it's technology. You get some pretty good technological feedback and that can be motivating for people. But there's other potential advantages such as this. And I think it really does allow us to be very, very specific when it comes to that force velocity curve in training speed strength or strength speed, etc. Because remember, Without knowing the actual velocity, we're simply going to try to, and we're assuming these correlations with percentages. 40% 1RM should allow you to move at X speed. Therefore, it's giving you a speed strength training effect. But with velocity-based training, we can actually hone in on that if we have the proper technology. Now, it can also be very motivating because you get rep by rep feedback. So it can be motivating within yourself. That is, you know, maybe I moved 150 pounds, at 0.8 meters per second for whatever lift. And the next set, yeah, I wanna to try to beat that. I want 0.85. Or maybe I'm training with my buddy, similar physical abilities. They moved it at 0.8, I wanna move it at 0.9. Now, another advantage is auto regulation. Now, hopefully you remember, auto regulation is the automatic regulation of training based on readiness or preparedness or how the person is feeling or performing today. Oftentimes, we, we assess auto regulation by questions. 
you know, how fresh do you feel today? I gave you some metrics earlier this semester. We can measure vertical jump, grip strength, etc. But we can also simply look at the performance if we have velocity-based training devices. For example, I said I normally move 150 pounds at 0.8 meters per second. What happens if today I move it at 0.7? Am I just being lazy or am I like, what's the reason? Did I lose power? No, I'm obviously not as explosive as I should be. Why? Oh, maybe my nervous system's not as fresh as it should be. I would never know that I'm not moving it as fast if I didn't have actual velocity based data. You'd never see that in the naked eye. You would just say, Brett, yeah, 150 is your three sets of three today for power or for, you know, speed strength or strength speed, whatever. But if I knew the actual metric, then I'd say, you know what? No, let's drop that down to 140. For whatever reason, you're not as explosive today, but all I care about is that training effect. I want the training effect that happens at 0.8 meters per second. All right, so another valuable uh, piece of information. The other way we can use it is proximity to failure. You know, we've talked about pros and cons of, of training to failure and using maybe an RPE of eight, staying two reps shy of failure. And there's actually correlations between the speed at which someone moves the bar and when they're going to reach failure. So, for example, I might say, okay, I want three sets of six, but you're only going to, and I want you to do it until you hit 0.4 meters per second. Because everybody tends to grind to a halt, of course, as they reach failure. So 0.4 meters per second tells me you haven't reached failure yet, but you're getting pretty close. All right. Now, I want to point out some interesting data here that came out in the testing the actual velocity at 1RM in various lifters. Now, we had average squatters, experienced squatters, and national level power lifters. And they measured simply how fast does the bar move when they perform their one repetition max. And basic line of thinking would think power lifters will probably move their 1RM faster than non-power lifters, right? I mean, the stronger people, so they'd move it faster. But the results are actually opposite. The higher level power lifters move their 1RM more slowly compared to novice strength athletes. And the reason what this shows is by training with heavy weights over time, you actually teach yourself or learn to grind. And what I mean by that is when most people would fail as the bar speed slows down, these people are more experienced and can push through and continue to recruit and use motor learning abilities and motor control to push through and grind out the extra repetition. Obviously, if they're able to push themselves down as low as 0.23 and still move the bar, they're able to push themselves harder and, of course, push more weight.